So we are happy to have uh, Konstantinos Kalapotharakos today with us, uh, at least for all who is uh, right now connected, uh, he's known, no special introduction is needed. Right now he's speaking from his uh, apartment, from, <laughs> not from Goddard. But okay, you see the affiliations, uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and University of Maryland. Uh, you already know the title of the talk uh, that uh, we have already advertised, interpreting the thermal and non-thermal high energy emission in multipolar field pulsar magnetospheres. And Costas, uh, let's start. We have nothing else to say for now and there will be time for some questions at the end. Okay, let's start. Okay. I would like to thank Panos for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, I know Yanis uh, follows our work, but uh, it's been some time since uh, the last time that I presented uh, our work in, uh, in front of all of you. Uh, so today I will discuss uh, how our studies uh, over the last several years have led to a robust interpretation of the thermal and non-thermal high energy emission in multipolar field uh, pulsar magnetospheres. Here you see uh, my collaborators in uh, several parts of uh, these uh, studies. Uh, here is the uh, outline of the talk. Uh, first, we will see an overview. I will try to introduce and remind, uh, for those that are not familiar, uh, familiar the fu fundamental notions about uh, pulsar magnetospheres. Uh, a big uh, chapter of my talk is related to the understanding of uh, non-thermal high energy emission, where in the uh, Fermi era of uh, GeV band, uh, we have uh, pulse detection in very high energy up to uh, multi-TV uh, as we are moving towards the CTA observations. Uh, I will discuss our recent work uh, that uh, revealed the fundamental plane of uh, gamma ray pulsars. And uh, we will see also microscopic, but mostly uh, kinetic particle cell global magnetosphere models. And uh, we will see how the comparison between the observations and uh, the models uh, leads to the implies the existence of. Uh, and a detected uh, pulsar population in the MEV band uh, that is uh, going probably to be detected in uh, by future telescope missions. And uh, I will also present uh, our work on broadband and very high energy emission models. The next uh, big chapter of my talk is the understanding of thermal high energy emission. We are also in the nicer era where we have thermal X-rays and the modeling of these uh, waveforms uh, have led to the constraints of uh, the stellar mass radius and through that the equation of state in neutral stars. I will show our work uh, based on uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo multipolar magnetic field explorations. So we will see field uh, that in this case we have field degeneracies and we will see how the combination of gamma rays and uh, from Fermi and the thermal X-rays from nicer data uh, lift uh, at least partly this uh, field degeneracies. Uh, finally, we will see the summary, the future directions and the broader impact of these uh, uh, studies. And uh, hopefully it will be clear in my talk that uh, the interpretation of the observations requires a judicious interaction between models and data. And during my talk, uh, uh, it will be evident that uh, the power of simulation, but also that much of the understanding comes from simplicity. Uh, so an overview here, we know pulsars, uh, the first pulsar was detected 55 years ago. We know they are rapidly rotating neutral stars with huge surface magnetic fields for millisecond pulsars. These can reach up to 10 to the 8 Gauss for young pulsars 10 to the 13 Gauss. And they radiate electromagnetic waves in almost all spectrum for radio uh, up to gamma rays. And the observations show that pulsars spin down, which means that they are continuously lose rotational energy. Uh, here's what essentially we observe. Uh, here we see for the light curves, uh, the pulses for two periods here for crap pulsar for different wavelengths for radio up to very high energy gamma rays. 
in this case, all the peaks for all the wavelengths uh, are at the same phase. This is not the general case. We see cases where the radio comes first and then we have the gamma rays and the radio lag is the phase lag between the, the radio peak and the first gamma ray peak while with small delta, while the capital delta here shows the phase difference between the two gamma ray peaks. Uh, Fermi has uh, revolutionized the study of gamma ray pulsars, playing a catalytic role on the current modeling of the high energy emission in pulsar magnetospheres. Since the launch of Fermi, the number of gamma ray pulsars, detected gamma ray pulsars, has increased by a factor of 45. Now we have more than 270 uh, detections, and 117 of them are compiled in the second pulsar catalog. And this has uh, uh, led us from uh, a discovery of astronomy by establishing a number of trends and correlations. One of the best uh, main results was that the observed gamma ray emission originates in the outer magnetosphere. Here we see from the second partial catalog some of these uh, correlation, the radio lag versus the peak separation or the spin down power versus the total gamma ray luminosity. Now we have many objects, so we have statistics and uh, we can get uh, better constraints about the uh, the physical mechanisms. Uh, we have also recent detections by MAGIC and HES2 of very high energy emission from Crab, Villa, and Gaminga pulsars, which implies an additional emission component, uh, and inverse Compton scattering seems to be the most original candidate. Here we see results from Crab. Uh, here uh, we have the Fermi band, but here we see that this extends up to the spectrum up to 1.5 uh, TeV. The peaks are in phase with the Fermi peaks. Both peaks are detected. And uh, here we see for Villa Passa, we know uh, there is an announcement that we have detection for Villa that reaches up to even higher than 7 TeV. Of course, the publication is not uh, yet out. Uh, so we don't know the details about the spectrum and these energies. But uh, the other thing is that uh, based on the announcement that has been done is that only the second peak in this case is detected in these high energies. Uh, just to remind you, pulsars are similarly low magnetic machines. The main uh, uh, principle is similar to that of Faraday dish. You have a conductor that rotates its own magnetic field. So because of the Lorentz force, you have a charge polarization that uh, introduces some electric fields and the potential drop. The faster the rotation is, the higher the fields are, the larger this uh, uh, potential drop is. And when you have wires, then you close the circuit. And uh, here in this example, the lamp uh, uh, is on. And uh, for the pulses, we have a spherical conductor. We have a charge polarization in this case. The electric field inside that uh, is given by this expression. And when you don't have any particles outside, you have the so-called magnetosphere vacuum. We have analytic expression for this from 55. You see the magnetic field with the dipole magnetic field with the red arrows and a quadrupole electric field by the blue arrows. And uh, in this case, we have, as I said, no particles. To, so we have a potential drop, but we don't have the wires to close the circuit. The issue is that here you have uh, huge voltages because of the high fields and the fast rotations. Uh, and you may have seed particles that are enough to initiate uh, pair cascade processes. And in this case, you may have enough particles to sort out the accelerating electric fields everywhere in the magnetosphere. And in this case, we say that we are in the force-free dynamics regime. The pair production can be either by photon uh, interaction with mag strong magnetic fields or by photon-photon uh, pair production. And of course, we know that we see observations uh, in high energy. So we know that we have accelerating of particles, acceleration of particles. And uh, this means that uh, the situation is not ideal, apparently. And actually, what we see is the result of uh, the pulsar's effort to not a, a successful effort to construct perfect conductive wires using their huge fields and their microphysical processes. 
just to remind you the force free solutions for the ally rotator we know the ckf solution and uh, for oblique rotators by spitkovsky uh, here we see based on our simulations uh, the uh, for the ally rotator when the rotational axis and the magnetic axis uh, coincide we see the current uh, density structure and here the charge density in the magnetic field uh, we see that uh, we have an inward current flowing near the pole and we have an outward current after some point and the main part of this current flows along an equatorial current sheet uh, and the circuit closes in the currency that you have along the separatrix here that separates the closed from the open field lines here is the light cylinder the light cylinder is the cylinder where the the corrotation with the star becomes equal to the speed of light and you see beyond that uh, cylinder in uh, the force free regime all the magnetic lines should open as we see here because the particles cannot uh, move faster than the speed of light uh, in the oblique case uh, we see different slices the symmetry the axisymmetry uh, breaks but uh, the situation more or less uh, remains the same. We have a uh, uh, currency that originates from the tip of the closed zone near the light cylinder, as you can see, an ondulating current sheet. And uh, here you see this uh, for large up, survives up to large distances for different inclination angles, the angle of the magnetic field uh, with respect to the rotational axis. Uh, and uh, you see on the poloidal plane the structure, and here uh, you see the 3D structure of this uh, current sheet in uh, the 3D space. And here you see the 3D structure of the magnetic field lines uh, for different inclination angles again. Uh, the red lines are the open lines though that cross the light cylinder, they are curved, so they are uh, curved and they are curled the curl B, the corresponding curl B uh, supports the current that we saw earlier, and the blue lines are the open lines, uh, the, I'm sure the closed lines that uh, are closed inside the light cylinder. Uh, soon after the discovery of the force-free solutions, uh, it became uh, evident that the equatorial current sheet uh, beyond the light cylinder uh, is a perfect candidate for the gamma ray light curves. And uh, you see here uh, the light curves corresponding to uh, emission in the current sheet from our walk and uh, from Bayan Spitkovsky. You see light curves similar to those observed by Fermi. And uh, of course, uh, also it became evident that, as I said, the force free is an ideal case. So you don't actually have electric field. So uh, it became evident that you need to go. To dissipative models and uh, we considered in general a model the so-called FIDO model first free side dissipative outside where you have a finite conductivity or you have a resistivity which is not zero uh, near the equatorial currency region every you know, all the other places have infinite conductivity so zero uh, resistivity and uh, when you do that, you get electric, accelerating electric fields. And by using test particles and assuming curvature radiation, we are able to reproduce uh, the radio lag versus peak separation diagram. As you can see here, it, this model remains actually the only one in the literature that uh, does so uh, good this uh, job uh, here. And uh, not only this, but uh, okay. Before I go to the next, it's good to understand the significance of the cutoff energy. Here, what we see, uh, we see based on our analysis, the cutoff energy as a function of a dot for millisecond pulsars, red uh, color and young pulsars, uh, green color. And the importance for the cutoff energy is that uh, sets uh, stricter constraints because you see that. Uh, even though it has some trends, uh, in general, the range is uh, less than one order of magnitude from sub GV up to five, six GV, compared to the total gamma ray luminosity that the range of which is orders, many orders of magnitude. And uh, 
using uh, the electric fields and the test particle trajectories, uh, we were able trying to reproduce not only the shapes of the light curves, but also the correct cutoff energies, because since you have electric fields, you can calculate the energy of the particles. And so you can uh, calculate the corresponding uh, emission and the spectra as well. And uh, we found that way, not only the region where you have uh, dissipation, which is the region of the equatorial transit, but we were able also to get some expression for the conductivity as a function for the spin down power for both young and millisecond uh, pulsars. We will stay uh, for the cutoff energies, uh, which uh, seem that uh, provide unique insight for the termination of the accelerated electric field. The main assumptions was that, uh, again, that we have curvature radiation and the radiation reaction limit regime. This means that the energy gain the particles uh, have uh, due to the, because of the electric fields that they encounter uh, becomes equal to the radiation reaction losses for curvature radiation. You see, this goes proportion to the gamma to four Lorentz factor over the uh, square of the radius of curvature in this case. And uh, for the curvature radiation, you know also the expression for the cutoff energy. And assuming also that all the action is on the equatorial current sit near the light cylinder, then you have an estimation of the radius of curvature, uh, which is of the order of magnitude of the light cylinder radius. And then for each uh, object, you know, from Fermi, the cutoff energy, so you can have an estimation of the corresponding energies for the particles that produce that emission. If you get this uh, estimation, then you can go here and you can have an estimation of the accelerated electric field, which can be measured in units of the corresponding magnetic field at the light cylinder. When you do this exercise for all the uh, pulsars, you get this diagram that shows the accelerating electric field in B light cylinder units as a function of the spin down power, which actually reveals the operational regime of all these objects. And you see for high spin down powers, this electric field in these units becomes small, which implies that uh, you go to more ideal uh, cases where the accelerating electric field in these units uh, decreases while as the spin down power increases you see that the accelerating electric field increases but eventually it saturates to a value which is which never exceeds uh, the magnetic field at the light cylinder because assuming that all the action is at the light cylinder the electric field can never exceed the local value of the magnetic field uh, this is important as i say because this reveals the operational regime of all the objects for millisecond red and young pulses. And if you had measured the electric field in absolute units, you would get a, a diagram like this. First of all, this separates the two uh, populations. And not only that, but you see that in actual, in absolute units, the electric field increases with the dot. And only when you use the, the correct unit uh, the magnetic field of the light cylinder, because as I said, all the action is there, then you can unify the, uh, the two populations. Eventually, you get uh, the, uh, the, as I said, the operational regime of, this, of all these objects. Recently, uh, actually, uh, working uh, in a similar way, extending our considerations a little bit, uh, the same assumptions uh, and using actually, I will not go into all the details, trivial scalings and uh, the trivial relations about the cutoff energy, the radiation reaction limit regime, etc. For the curvature radiation, it's important to say that uh, in this case, as I said before, the radius of curvature is proportional to the radius, uh, the light cylinder radius, because these follow the magnetic line in general trajectories, I'll not go to the details, uh, and which is proportional to the period. If you do these rather trivial calculations, you end up to some relation that uh, says that the total gamma ray luminosity is proportional to the cutoff energy to four thirds, to the magnetic field to one sixth, 
times the spin down power to five over 12. Uh, if you do the same exercise, but assume if you assume now the synchrotron radiation, the only thing that changes is that the radius of curvature now is proportional to the local uh, gyro radius. And then you get an expression that says that the total gamma ray luminosity is proportional to the cutoff energy times the spin down power. But then uh, going to the Fermi data, we have uh, from the second parser catalog, we had 88 parsers, Young and Mill second parsers, that uh, had published total gamma ray luminosity values and cutoff energies. When we tried to fit for these uh, populations, we ended up with this relation that. Uh, uh, seems provides exponents that uh, are remarkably close to the theoretical uh, predictions for curvature radiation, as you can see here. Uh, this uh, result uh, soon and independently confirmed uh, by Ploek et al. Uh, when they worked in uh, on the population of millisecond pulsars only, as you can see here. And uh, of course, this uh, fundamental plane is a 3D plane in a 4D space, and so it's hard to visualize. So uh, in order to show you uh, how it looks like, uh, we had to combine these uh, variables, B and uh, the magnetic field and the spin down power, and these three new variables, X, Y, and Z. The theoretical expression plane is, in this case, X times Y. Well, this is what you get when you uh, apply this fit for the Fermi data. Here we see the fundamental plane, the theoretical, and the, uh, the one corresponding to the data. You see how close to each other these are. For young pulsars, black points, and uh, millisecond pulsars, gray points. And you see, even though there is some scattering around that, uh, which can be, in general, uh, explained, it justified, uh, you see that these objects follow very well this uh, fundamental uh, plane. Uh, more recently, this is a paper that uh, we're writing right now. Uh, we uh, doubled the sample based uh, using the four FGL data uh, and the spectral analysis uh, they did. Uh, and uh, now we have 162 objects and uh, we get a, a, a fundamental planar relation which is consistent a little bit different but still consistent with the one that uh, we got originally you see again uh, that uh, the objects follow quite well this fundamental plane and let's uh, go to 3d kinetic particle cell models uh, we saw that we have to work, we had work with microscopic models, which provided uh, uh, useful insight. Uh, however, the fields and the particles in microscopic models are treated separately, so the treatment is not sort of consistent. So we developed uh, a code, the C3PA code, that uh, has all these nice modules, and we run our simulations uh, in super clusters. Uh, at NASA supercomputers. And uh, here, uh, let's see some of these simulations. Uh, uh, in our approach, we use arbitrary particle injection, which even though is not based on microphysical, uh, uh, it's not microphysically justified, uh, it still uh, provides solutions that uh, and field structure are consistent. Uh, field structure and particle distributions. Uh, here we see the charge density and the magnetic field lines. Here the magnetic field lines and positrons and electrons. In the beginning, no particle injection. So we go to the vacuum solution. At some point, we start injecting electrons and positrons, and the force free solution starts being formed. And you see the magnetic field lines open, the current sheet uh, starts being formed. As I said, you see that. The, everywhere you have electrons and positrons, but the excess is what the force free solution requires, as you can see. Uh, the, the, our main findings were are that the most of the emission uh, comes from a region near the equatorial current seat beyond the light shield. There, uh, in this case, as you can see, especially for high uh, particle uh, injections. And uh, 
based on our studies, uh, we understood, you remember, I mean, the, uh, earlier I said that uh, you need, in order to regulate the emission, you need to, to have some kind of, uh, you, you must regulate eventually the accelerating electric field that you have in the light, at the light cylinder. Because this regulates the energy of the particles, and since this regulates the energy of the particles, this actually regulates the uh, the, the the high energy emission. We found that uh, in peak models and in reality, is what regulates the high energy emission, the gamma emission, is the particle injection rate along the separatrix here, the red uh, regions. Uh, that separates the closed from the open field line. And why is that? Because uh, uh, as you inject particles here, because the current flow connects uh, and goes towards the current sheet, the more particles you put there, the more particles will end up in the current sheet and the less the accelerated, corresponding accelerating electric field will be there. Uh, also, another parameter that plays a role is the width of this apparatric zone. Apparently, the higher the width, the uh, higher the, the accelerating fields that you have here. For the other regions in general, uh, you must have sufficient particle injection in order to keep something close to the force free solution, but not necessarily something very high. Uh, so, uh, and it's important to have sufficient because you need to have a field structure in general that's close to the force free one because this is essential for getting the the shapes of the light curve, the gamma ray light curve that are similar to uh, to the Fermi ones, and uh, it is important in order to be able to reproduce the delta delta correlation that we saw earlier. And here we see the uh, particle energy distributions for different cases uh, for Young and millisecond parsers. Uh, the understanding is the following, as you increase the particles, the particle injection rates, then uh, from red here to, uh, to blue, you decrease the corresponding accelerating electric field because you have more parts so you can sort out better the electric field. And because you decrease that uh, field, uh, then you decrease the particle energies as you can see here. On the other hand, as you increase the energetics, I mean, the magnetic field and the, and, and the angular, uh, frequency of the pulsars, which means that you increase the spin down power, then apparently you increase the uh, corresponding accelerated electric fields and the particle energies, as you can see here. Similar things go for the spectra, as you can see here. Again, as the particle increase from red to blue, uh, the electric field decreases, the particle energy decreases, and so the cutoff energy of the emission of the spectra decreases as well. Uh, again, as the energetic of the individual parser increases, the magnetic field and the mega, then the electric field, the uh, particle energy, the atop energies increase as well, as we can see here in the spectrum. This, we understand that uh, uh, this, we can get constraints from this, because uh, as we will see, because when you try to compare with the cutoff energy that you get from Fermi and the cutoff energy, as I said, have a short range in the observations, you can say for each of the spin down powers, for each B and omega, uh, what model best describes uh, the, the corresponding Fermi data. Uh, looking at the corresponding light curves, we are able also to reproduce uh, the delta-delta correlation even using the particle cell models, as you can see here. And uh, here we see the fundamental plane, which checks also the fundamental plane. This is the one corresponding to Fermi data. This is the theoretical one. And here we see the fundamental plane, uh, assuming all the particle cell models. And you see this is consistent. Uh, it's uh, the peak model reproduced the fundamental plane, consistent with the theoretical and the observational relation. And uh, here we see what we call the fundamental plane, which still is uh, consistent to the other two, uh, but for only the optimum models in this case. 
And we'll see what I mean by saying optimum. Here we have plotted everything all together. Uh, the black and uh, uh, gray points are the young pulses and millisecond pulses here, while the color points are the peak models. The red, uh, if you can see, blue and green are what we call the optimum models. First of all, we see that all the, all the models lie on the fundamental plane. However, it becomes clear that uh, the models, even though they lie in uh, the entire, in everywhere, I mean, uh, they are on the fundamental plane, they, the actual objects are not in every place where the models are. So we call optimum the models that in the region of the fundamental plane where we have actual objects that we observe. Uh, the other models are the magenta, in this case, uh, with magenta color, are the non-optimum models. We will see why we have uh, objects in only some places and not uh, in the other places in the fundamental plane. When we project everything on the E dot B uh, of the fundamental plane, we project it to what we have here on the plane of this and this axis, okay? And uh, these are the objects that you observe, young pulses and millisecond pulses. And if someone gets the ratio, even though we show that the fundamental plates are close to each other, if we, uh, uh, if we see the ratio between the total gamma ray luminosity corresponding to the Fermi fundamental plane over that corresponding to the model fundamental plane, we get that the, uh, this ratio is a little bit higher of a factor for the region where the objects are, the actual objects are, it's between two and three. Even though this factor is not big for these numbers here that extend many orders of magnitude, uh, it seems a problem. But actually, it's a convenient problem, if someone can say, because uh, the total gamma ray luminosities that the observers provide assume some value for the beaming factor. And beaming factor tells you how uniform the emission is. And when you see, a, as an observer, you see some emission, uh, you don't see apparently all the emission that goes everywhere in the sky, you see a part, and uh, you have to make some assumption what part of the emission you see and how you can uh, have an estimation of the total emission. And the observer so assume that the BIMI factor is for all the cases is equal to one. But according to our models, it seems that the BIMI factor is actually, uh, especially in the cases where most of the emission uh, occurs is uh, lower than one, which means that according to our models, the total gamma ray luminosity observers provide is an overestimation, which may says actually that the factor that you see here, this discrepancy, I mean, between the two values of total gamma ray luminosity is actually much smaller because of, at, at least according to our modeling. Uh, so, and the next thing is the, uh, let's talk about death lines and death valleys. As I said in, earlier, the accelerating electric field, again, here we see uh, on the projection, Okay, of the fundamental plane that we were looking at before. Uh, the accelerating electric fields, as I said before, uh, can never exceed that of the magnetic field of the light cylinder, assuming that all the action takes place there. Uh, assuming that this is the magnet, an electric field of that order of magnitude, there is the maximum one, then assuming the radiation reaction limit regime, you can get the highest gamma value range factor that you can get there. And uh, when you consider this value, then you get some lines here that depend on E dot and B star. It's not exactly lines, but uh, for a certain magnetic field value is actually a line. It's a region in general. Uh, and uh, without going into the details, from trivial relations, you get that the cutoff energy, the maximum cutoff energy goes proportional to the spin down power to seven over 16. 
and this is what is expressed by these lines. And you see that all the objects, almost all the objects are below these lines. You can never have anything about these lines. Apparently, there are differences because you don't have always the same magnetic field. And you see that the millisecond pulses and young pulses that are separated but four orders of magnitude for the magnetic field, the corresponding death lines here are uh, separated by that uh, much. And uh, the important thing is, however, is that, yes, this is the maximum uh, energy that we can get. But this is, remains true as long as this uh, gamma value is smaller than the available potential drop and the energy that the particles can, uh, can get. And this is related to the potential drop that you have in general in the polar cap. So as you become less energetic, at some point, this, the maximum uh, value of the gamma it's not anymore the one that you get by the radiation reaction limit, but it is uh, limited by the available potential drop the particles can uh, encounter. And so after some, uh, below some spin down power here, you have uh, the prediction is that the maximum cut of energy uh, scales as spin down power becomes much steeper to seven over four, you see compared to this relation. And, uh, this explains probably why we don't see uh, pulsars below that uh, threshold. One is because, first of all, the total gamma ray luminosity becomes smaller, so you have a smaller number of photons to observe, and so the sensitivity is an issue there. But also, another thing is that the corresponding cut of energies decrease very fast after some point, and uh, because Fermi can never cannot see much below 100 MeV. Uh, apparently, it's much more difficult. becomes It becomes much more difficult to observe these objects, and uh, this uh, analysis implies that uh, uh, probably there are pulsars, because you see that as you go towards smaller spin down powers, the pulsars try to become as efficient as they can. So you expect them to be in this border region. And uh, the prediction here says that uh, there are uh, MEV pulsars that uh, remain to be currently detected, and the pulsars that uh, are expected to be detected by MEV, MEV telescopes like uh, Amigo uh, in near future. Uh, and here is the picture that provides a uh, uh, global description of uh, the entire population of young and millisecond pulsars. Uh, again, what we see here in the projection of the fundamental plane, here we see the object that we observe, millisecond and uh, young pulsars. And apparently in this region of the fundamental plane, apparently we don't have objects because that they are either are too rare or uh, they do not exist uh, here. We don't have these uh, values. And uh, here is the forbidden region because we don't, as according to the analysis we saw earlier, we cannot have objects in the region of the fundamental plane. And uh, this is the death border region. And uh, apparently uh, here is the region uh, of MEV pulsars probably that will be detected uh, uh, in the near future, as I said. And here uh, I say microphysics and I have these arrows because the models uh, where the particle injection is arbitrary and is not based on physical, uh, it's not physically justified. We can still have models in these regions of the fundamental plane. However, it seems that the microphysics does, uh, does not allow uh, real objects to be here. So for example, here you cannot have real objects because the particle injection as this uh, is enforced by the microphysics is actually much higher. And that's why you have more particle injections which decreases the cut of energy and you can never have objects in this region. On the other hand, for uh, even though our models can produce objects here, uh, 
the microphysics says look and based on what we see from the observed objects that look you don't have you, uh, in these regions for these spin down power values and magnetic fields you the microphysics is not so efficient uh, in producing pairs and so the cutoff energies go up and stay there so of course as you go towards smaller spin down powers you see that the efficiency becomes maximum and so you get in this death border region and eventually the prediction is that you are going to go towards this direction here and this direction here uh, and uh, before i go to the next uh, thing let's see our uh, the videos here based on the simulations the peak simulation here you see the rotation and the high energy particles that produce the gamma ray emission you see the uh, they trace the equatorial can see these particles these are the initial frame and here we see the same picture however the same video however we see also the with green i'm sorry with yellow the photons that are emitted the high energy photons and here we have an observer plane and some of the uh, photons we see are green and green are the photons that uh, cross this plane perpendicularly which means these are the photons that this observer uh, the line of sight is along the perpendicular to this plane will observe at the infinite distance every time that the green photon passes through this plane we have a detection here we see eight uh, rotations and uh, for each detection we fault in one period all the photons and we gradually construct uh, the light curve and what we see here is actually what's happening i mean we wait many periods for fermi to collect all the photons and to uh, build uh, the corresponding light curves this is a demonstration of how things uh, work and let's talk a little bit about our modeling in uh, very high energy and broadband uh, uh, spectrum emission uh, that reaches up to uh, multi TV. Uh, this model, in general, of course, it's very difficult to work in uh, particle cell models. So we use force free dissipative models with test particle trajectories. The model has several parameters. Not too many. Here you assume some low electric field along the separatrix that accelerates the primaries and the higher electric field here in the uh, equatorial current sheet. Uh, you have some multiplicity of pairs that are not accelerated, they are injected just above the separatrix. You must assume some radius for the radio emission. This is important because pairs in order to produce synchronous radiation, which seems to be important for the lower energy part, uh, get uh, pitch angles through resonant absorption from radio photons. So radio in this model is important in the sense that produces the pitch angle necessary for pairs to produce the synchronous radiation. And apparently for what you observe depends also on alpha and zeta, the inclination angle and the observer angle. Apparently, for the pairs, you have to assume some energy distribution as they are injected from the uh, polar caps here. And you, you assume some energy distribution that come from pair cascade studies. And here we see some broadband emission for Villa. The main parts, the main results are the, the pairs produce synchrotron radiation uh, in optical and UV at lower altitude, you see here this component. The primary particles, mostly positrons, produce synchronous curvature with a peak at multi-GV here that can reach up to 100 GV. And this high energy part of this spectrum is in the curvature radiation regime. The primary particles, however, scatter the optical UV photons that are produced at lower energies uh, by pairs uh, to produce uh, through inverse copter scattering emission that reaches up to 10 TV, as you can see here. And the pairs also scatter uh, the optical UV photons to produce synchronous surf Compton uh, that uh, peaks, in this case, of course, very low, 1 to 10, 10 GV for young pulsars and up to 100 GV for millisecond pulsars. Here you see that uh, this uh, prediction for Villa is close to the, here you see the detection limit for HES2. This is the nominal detection 
limit for Villa, they have more time. So this is expected to be lower. We don't know the exact results uh, because the publication is not out yet, but our prediction is very close. And uh, actually it's in the right place where the maximum is where this uh, detection takes place. Uh, for crab, we have uh, similar uh, things. Also in crab, like pulsars, the pair, uh, the synchronous self Compton, you see here the green line is uh, actually reaches much more significant and reaches up higher ranges and actually can explain the magic data for, for crab. Uh, also for Villa, you see that also this model uh, predicts also the fact that the at very high end, it's only the second peak uh, survives, as you can see here, the model and the observations. And uh, as we go for lower energies up to, from optical up to very high energies. And another thing that someone has to keep here is that the pulsed emission that reaches up to 10 TV requires apparently high energy particles through the inverse Compton scattering, because in order to have 10, EV, uh, 10 TV photons, uh, because in inverse Compton scattering, the low energy photons get energy for the high energy particles. And apparently in order to have eventually 10 TeV photons, you must have particles that have energy at least 10 TeV. And this is consistent with Kerbat's radiation instead of synchron that requires much lower particle energies and the fundamental plane theory that uh, we saw before. And let's go to the last uh, chapter that is related to the interpretation of the thermal X-ray millisecond pulsar emission. And we will see how we currently derive a neutron star multipolar fields and hopefully eventually uh, combined masses and stellar radii from a combination uh, uh, combined consideration of the Nicer and Fermi data. Here we see the recent Nicer results. Uh, we see the thermal uh, Nicer uh, X ray light curve for J0030 plus 0451. We see uh, very good quality, small error bars for this light curve. And two different groups, Riley et al. and Miller et al. model the X-ray thermal light curve incorporating around 20 parameters. And they found the stellar mass radius and uh, the corresponding observer angle. Uh, and also they found uh, the corresponding hotspots. The hotspots are considered to be uh, the the polar caps where the current as we saw earlier uh, originates and so that's why these regions are considered to be hot because they are they get energy from the particles that uh, end up there high energy particles and they found two hot spots like those that you see here of the same temperature and uh, interestingly both these uh, Polar caps are located in one uh, rotational hemisphere, as you can see, one is elongated, the other one is uh, more compact, uh, as you can see. Uh, in general, they found similar results, even though uh, the differences are related to the uh, different, slightly different uh, energy channels that they used. And uh, these structures for the hotspots and what's believed to be the polar caps, imply so strong evidence for multipolar, the existence of multipolar magnetic fields. However, the hotspot that these two groups provided are based on preselected shape patterns, which are unrelated to magnetic field structures. So uh, this motivate us, motivated us to try to find magnetic field structures that reproduce the bolometric nicer X-ray light curve. And we started uh, assuming static vacuum fields that have the advantage of analytic expressions and therefore very fast calculation. We consider offset dipole plus quadrupole M equals zero terms, which as we can see here, require allowing 11 parameters for the description of the offsets, the orientation of the magnetic momenta, in the uh, relative strength of the quadruple over the dipole moment. Uh, the polar caps or the hotspots, as uh, we say, in the pure central dipole uh, field 
are antipodal and near circular. Uh, however, as we start introducing the quadruple term and the offset, it is possible to get polar caps uh, that have similar features like those uh, implied by Miller et al. and uh, Raleigh et al. For this field structure, we see in yellow the closed field lines, uh, while the open field lines are denoted by magenta color, we see both originate from the uh, southern rotational hemisphere. For our study, we developed the methodology described by Psaltis and Johansen, and uh, we developed the general relativistic code, the Giggs code, that follows the photon trajectory in the full care metric, and though Schwarzschild metric would be adequate for this problem. And uh, the idea is simple. You start from an observer plane, uh, practical infinity, and we integrate photon trajectories that leave the plane perpendicularly, and we find where these photons hit the stellar surface, take into account the GR distortion outside the neutron star surface and the star uh, stellar rotation. Uh, in this first approach, we consider fixed the mass, the radius, and the observer angle values from Riley et al. and Miller et al. studies. And uh, we also assumed same temperature for the hot spot like those suggested by the two groups. Uh, of course, the reconstruction of the X-ray light curve, which means the intensity at each phase, requires additionally uh, the incorporation of the Doppler boosting, which is done uh, trivially implemented. And of course, it requires an adoption of an atmosphere model, which in general, in general provides the emission intensity as a function of the energy, but also the zenith angle. The zenith angle is the angle between the photon uh, direction and the perpendicular of the stellar surface. Miller et al. used the same atmosphere model, the pure, pure fully uh, ionized hydrogen, but we follow a simpler approach, considering the intensity is proportional to the cosine of the zenith angle to some power n. Uh, assuming the Raleigh et al. hot spot, we are able to reproduce the X-ray light here for n equal one for, for the Miller et al. n 0.65. Just to get an idea how n works here, we see the observer plane, and the effect of the exponent end, as n uh, increases, we get the uh, so-called uh, limb deacon, darkening effect, as we can see here, the edges become darker. Uh, we developed also a Markov chain Monte Carlo code, uh, a parallel one for the exploration of the corresponding parameter space. And here we see uh, the famous uh, corner plots uh, for the 11, uh, parameters for our analysis for one of the solutions. And here we see uh, how well the model light curve in the red color reproduces the nicer one, black one here, for one of the solutions. Here we see in yellow color the hot spots that we found for some magnetic field structure. And the, these regions, uh, the light uh, blue regions, denote the corresponding hot spots from Riley et al. We see that our results in some sense are similar. However, clearly one hotspot has different location and different orientation. The fitting is good, actually too good. The high square is below one, as you can see here. Uh, and here we see the correspondence between the uh, model uh, X-ray light curve and the observer plane. The located uh, hotspot produces the primary peak. Uh, while we're in the middle, we have the minimum. The second uh, peak comes when we have the second, the more compact uh, hotspot, then the minimum. And again, when the locating hotspot comes, we see the maximum. As I said in the beginning, I mentioned uh, we discovered field degeneracies, which means different field structures that fit the data. And here we see another solution of a very good fit. And uh, here, however, we see different, uh, slightly, no, quite different uh, hotspots. Uh, one is closed, but this one is much more content, closer to the rotational equator, even though both are in one rotational equator. In this case, the corresponding high square value is slightly higher than what we had before, but uh, still less than one. So from a statistical point of view, these two, uh, fits uh, these two solutions are equally well cases. Here we see an atlas of all the solutions for all et al uh, fixed values that we found. Here we, we see 
for the 11 parameters free. And here we had additional constraints here, the dipole at the center, and here additionally, the quadrupole along the Z axis. And we got very good solutions as you can see here. Uh, here I, you see the, all the model parameters. In general, the offsets uh, can be large, as you can see, uh, almost half the stellar radius. The quadrupole is much stronger than uh, in most of the cases. And only in one case, the quadrupole strength was uh, slightly smaller than the dipole one. In the next step, we proceed by considering realistic uh, near force free field structures. The disadvantage in this case is that the determination of the field structure requires the run of a large and time consuming simulation compared to analytic expressions. The advantage, though, is that these models provide the model gamma ray light curves, uh, as we have seen. Uh, when we did that, starting from the static vacuum field solution, we found field structure families of dissipative magnetospheres near force free regime that reproduce the nicer X ray light curves, as we here, see here in the left hand columns. Uh, with only one exception here, even though by eye, this model uh, seems uh, good, the corresponding high square is almost nine. So this one compared to the other is not a very good fit. We're not able to find something better for force-free solutions. Uh, but uh, at the same time, these models provide also the gamma relatives, which can be also uh, be compared with the Fermi one. And uh, we see that uh, even though these are the same, the thermal X-rays, the uh, gamma rays are not uh, the same. And uh, you see that in this case, we get in this model, the light curves are in the correct phases, but uh, the, uh, the ratio between the peak maxima is uh, not the correct one, besides the fact that this one is not a very good, does not provide a very good fit for the uh, thermal X-ray light curve. Uh, on the other hand, this, uh, this solution provides much better, uh, more consistent light curve for the gamma rays and also the X-rays. And so it becomes evident that when you combine the Fermi and the X-ray data and the nicer X-ray data, you get uh, uh, you can leave the field degeneracies like what we see here. Here we see the four field structures that uh, produce the nicer X-ray and the Fermi gamma ray light curves. Here you see the light blue lines are the closed lines, the magenta lines are the open uh, field lines, and the volume that you see here is the where the gamma rays are produced near the equatorial current seat. And here we zoom in. And we see the, only the open uh, field lines that uh, and their origin from the hotspot regions that lie in one uh, rotational hemisphere, as we can see here. I will not uh, say much. We have started the machine learning approach that seems that uh, can uh, revolutionize the speed and uh, to speed up uh, considerably the calculations uh, of the light curves. And uh, of course, uh, we have to do more towards this direction. And uh, here is the summary. Uh, we show the fundamental plane of gamma ray pulses. Uh, we show a relation between the total gamma ray luminosity, spin down power, the cutoff ends, the magnetic field on the stellar surface. We see this one based on the Fermi data and the theoretical one on the curvature radiation. Uh, it's interesting that uh, we discovered this uh, after we found the theoretical expression and we search in the data, usually it's the, uh, the opposite uh, uh, path is followed. First, you find some, uh, uh, some correlation, you try to find the underlying physical uh, justification. Uh, we saw kinetic uh, particle cell models. Uh, we saw the separatric injection model that reproduces the gamma ray light curve uh, patterns, the delta delta correlation and the fundamental plane. We saw that comparing the models and uh, the Fermi data, we got a deep understanding, as we can see here, and the first possible description of the entire population of the gamma ray pulses. Uh, understanding the death lines and death valleys, uh, we got indications uh, possibly of a new era of MEV pulses in the near future. 
to show the broadband and very high energy emission models where the TV emission is produced by events photo scattering when high energy primary particles scatter the low energy photons. And uh, these high energy particles that are required are consistent with Kevlar's radiation of the fundamental plane theory. Uh, we saw also that the nicer X-ray data reveal the multipolar magnetic field structure of millisecond pulses and the combination of nicer and Fermi data uh, uh, gamma ray data modeling when we consider both lift uh, the field degeneracies you may have in this case. Just to mention some of the future direction, we said about the microphysics, someone has to find exactly on a quantitative level how the microphysics behaves to impose the relations that we saw in the fundamental plane, the regions on the fundamental plane that are covered by the real object as this uh, dictated by the microphysics. We show that apparently we have the emission, the equatorial can see it, where we have reconnection. We have to understand better this uh, region with local simulations probably, and uh, how this can support uh, the observation of the fundamental plane. Uh, for the determination of uh, the magnetic fields, mass and radius, apparently a combined study has to be done where self-consistently the gamma rays, x-rays and radio data will be taken into account, uh, concluding to combined estimation of mass radius and magnetic field. The mass le machine learning and neural, neural, ne neural network uh, approach seems to be very promising towards this direction. Uh, apparently we need to do more realistic, very high energy emission broad spectrum models and just leave you here with the broader impacts of these studies because similar effects can uh, happen and occur in different environments like a rotatable, around rotating black holes, double merging neutron stars. Apparently all these uh, studies, especially the magnetic, the, the nicer, from the, related to the nice data are important for understanding the dense matter equation of state in uh, neutron stars. Apparently, the understanding of the magnetic field can tell us many things about the physical processes uh, related to the production evolution of internal magnetic field in millisecond pulses. Or we can understand the rocket effect that is a consequence of uh, the, ax the asymmetric uh, uh, pointing flag radiation that we have when you have. Uh, multipolar magnetic fields. Okay, so thank you very much. Well, thank you, Costa. Uh, okay, time for questions. If somebody uh, wants to ask something, please go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, keep it in English because uh, Manol is registering there and will be on our okay. website. So okay. if somebody wants to follow later. Thank you, Costas, for the talk. Uh, I have a question. When you try to break the the, the, the generacy with uh, of the nicer observations, the X-ray nicer observations, you use the gamma ray light curves. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dipole uh, field orientation alone, nothing else. Uh, so, from the models that you use to build the nicer light curves, you use some dipole component with a certain orientation, I guess, and that was uh, that the generacy was, lift, was lifted from the Fermi uh, pulses. My question is, in the high energy radiation, do you expect to see some uh, uh, indication of the higher order field structure on the star? The observations you have from the surface of the star are very uh, higher, high multiples. Do you expect uh, of that in the gamma ray light curves? In principle, yes. Uh, of course, uh, it's more difficult to uh, if you have a single object and looking, for example, at the light curves to say. Uh, whether this is coming from a multipolar field structure or not. Maybe uh, if you 
if you do this exercise for many objects, you know, for different orientation, et cetera, you may be able to find some statistical, uh, uh, you know, data there. I mean, some signals there that uh, say, look, we expect to have this or that uh, uh, feature. I mean, even though uh, the at large distance, uh, the there is some asymmetry that remains, and this is more important to be honest for millisecond pulses, uh, because if you have to see anything, it's only going to be for millisecond pulses. Because for young pulses, because the light cylinder is at much higher distance, uh, compare all, uh, always with the distance, uh, the, the radius of the star, the quadruple terms or even offs offsets that you may have there are not going to be observable in some sense because only the dipole field survives there. But for millisecond pulsars where the, uh, the light cylinder radius is relatively small compared to the stellar radius, yes, you expect to see this kind of uh, asymmetries there. Of course, as I said, you cannot, it's difficult to say for a single object what's going on, but probably there, there must be some uh, statistical signatures, but, but I cannot say more because apparently you have to do that, I mean, to, to see some statistical feature, I mean, uh, that, uh, has, that has some signature. Could it be that it affects the origin of pairs from the surface? Uh, this is, uh, you mean the signature? The, the, if the origin of pairs depends on the multipolar structure of the field, then it can, you can have pairs there and not there and somewhere else and so on and so forth. And that will affect the global solution in some sense because the global solution depends on where you put the pairs. Uh, that's true. And the other thing also is uh, that uh, it affects also the multiplicity because uh, and uh, probably it's quite probable that uh, millisecond pulses, which seems to be more prone to multipolar field structures, uh, gain a lot from this because uh, the pair production in the polar caps, these multipolar pol uh, polar caps, uh, is more efficient. However, uh, this will be important when someone wants to go to how the microphysics, as I said, supports the solution. Since you have the solutions, uh, yes, you may have some different signatures about the gamma ray emission, but uh, it's, not all, it's not always very clear that you are, you can say, for example, looking at the light, gamma ray light curves to say, oh, definitely, I have uh, particle injection only here, or I have particle injection there. It is probable, but it's not easy, and it's not something that always happens. Uh, but uh, it is important for millisecond pulsars, and it's uh, to, to consider the microphysics take into account the multipolar field structure, because there is possibility that if you assume uh, pure dipole fields, that the corresponding particle production that you have in this field structure, the classical field structures, uh, is not efficient enough to produce the first free solution that we observe. Maybe the multipolar field structure uh, enhances the pair production, which is important in order to reach the uh, force free or near force free solution for millisecond pulses. Okay, thank you. I, I agree completely. Yes, thank you very much.
Okay, there is time for more questions. If for some Can I else. also ask something? Um, yes, Christos, go ahead. Uh, okay, about the the phase lag peak to peak, say delta delta relation. Mm -hmm. If I understood it well, you said that all these models in which the emission comes essentially from the light cylinder are the only ones that are to really reproduce that. Uh, do you have a good theory of uh, why, why the, the the delta delta why there is the yeah why there is the correlation altogether i mean first of all why there is the phase lag and second why why it is correlated in this way the, the correlation uh, yes uh, let me uh, go to maybe i have some uh, Yeah, I don't see. Uh, see if I have some kind of. Okay, so if you had. Uh, Here, your screen looks frozen to me. I don't know. If yeah, no, no. I'm trying to figure out if I have some slide uh, in uh, after those that you saw that uh, has some sky map uh, because if you see the the sky map. Uh, then uh, you can uh, understand this uh, feature. But uh, let me, actually I can, uh, what is the best way to do that? I mean, uh, okay, so if uh, I will try to, uh, to plot here, okay. So uh, if you have the, the sky map, Okay, that uh, here you have uh, the phase, and here you have the, let's say the observer angle, you see that the sky maps goes like this. Okay, this is the emitting region. What you observe depends on uh, what zeta you are. So you have horizontal uh, slices of, because you are at some certain zeta. Uh, the correlation says that uh, as you increase because of this S shape, as you increase Z or decrease Z or whatever, uh, you understand that uh, when the phase lag, because the, the radio comes here, let's say, because this is zero where the poles are. So when you move for different Z, you increase delta because this is that small delta. And for small deltas, you have, as you can see, higher capital delta. Okay. So as you go, for example, a different zeta in this uh, slice, then uh, you get a higher small delta and a smaller, uh, uh, a smaller uh, capital delta. And this is exactly the behavior that, uh, let me take you to the, uh, here, you see, Small, uh, high delta means sm uh, small, uh, high, small delta, uh, high radio lag means small separation, uh, peak separation. Uh, ex exactly because you have this uh, shape, as I said before. So, uh, so the region- the, geo the geometry of the current seat. Uh, in some sense, it's uh, how you see the current seat in the, on the sky. Okay. okay, how this is projected on the sky, and apparently is related to the uh, to the structure of the magnetic field line, and which imposes the uh, trajectories, uh, the the direction of the trajectories. So, as you let me explain to Christos, the horizontal axis is the the phase of the pulse the exactly. period the, and the perpendicular axis is the angle from which you are observing the system okay and uh, as an observer what you see uh, depends on uh, uh, what what zeta you are and apparently if you are at this zeta for example you are going to see uh, this radio lag and this peak separation okay if you are in a different zeta, for example, here, you are going to see a smaller radio lag. 
So you go toward this direction here, okay? And the larger capital delta, peak separation, which is exactly what you see here. Just to mention that even if you see the current sheet, uh, if you assume uniform emission in the current sheet, you get this good uh, correlation of that kind, which is in some sense well understood according to this feature. However, the radio lags in uh, uh, are a little bit higher than those that are observed. And for FIDO model, where you don't have uniform emission, uh, not from both poles, it's a bit more complicated what you get. Eventually, you end up with the correct radio lags. The correlation is more easily to, uh, to be understood based on this figure, which is more or less the same or similar for many models. But uh, the, the new thing here, or the good thing here, is that uh, it's not only the correlation how radio lag and peak separation are related to each other, but what the actual values of the radio lag and uh, that uh, matches those that uh, are observed. Yeah, but on the other hand, I mean, uh, here, for example, the, I understand that the values of the small delta big, which you have in the plot, let's say, come directly from the modeling of the emission. So you produce, let's say, some synthetic curve, what the model would give you, like uh, light curves, and you get those numbers. On the other hand, from the geometry of the current sheet, you could get the sort of intersection of the lines that you were telling me before directly, I mean, just by the geometry, no? So you could try uh, to draw probably a line passing through those data or not? Yes, you can do that. However, if you do that without taking into account the particles, as I said, just by looking at the, and this has been done, I mean, by other authors, uh then uh, you get i mean because you can assume the geometric structure which is you know analytic expression for the current shape if you do that and you assume uniform emission this is exactly a line here this is exactly a line here and uh, if you do this exercise then yes you are going to get this uh correlation but everything is going to be a little bit to the right Let's see. Uh, I see that uh, Demos has raised his hand. Uh, let's let's go on because we're gonna have finally problem with the time. Demos, you want to ask something? Please go ahead. Uh, nah, mainly comment actually. I yeah, please. I know this work <laughs> uh, uh, from close, and therefore the uh, one comment is to Yanis' question. Uh, the multipolar field. Uh, yes, if the particles are injected from near the surface this should be apparent in the gamma rays, and they're not. So uh, in that sense, that, that's why these are useful. Uh, we don't see this, and therefore most, it argues, that it's not a proof here, there's no proof in astrophysics as such. Uh, it argues uh, on, face, on its face value that the emission, the particle injection, whatever it is, happens at large radii. And of course, uh, Jan, you and I sort of agree on that. <laughs> Uh, individually. Uh, the other point uh, I would like to make, I don't know if Costas was made that very strongly, is that for these uh, nicer sim uh, fit simulations, uh, we have assumed the mass and the radius that are given by the other groups. If you look at the other groups, uh, the two different groups, uh, uh, polar caps, if you like, they're very different. So the mis it implies this huge amount of uncertainty or degeneracy in there. And I don't know what's going to happen. They, I think this, this is a plan now to include, to leave the mass and the radius arbitrary also and do a fit of the global uh, gamma ray, X-ray uh, light curves together with the mass and the, uh, and the uh, radius free. And... Uh, uh, we don't know what the answer of that will be. So uh, another thing is that this particular object, 0030 plus uh, whatever, is uh, only one of these uh, objects. Unfortunately, it seems to be the one with the best signal. Uh, 
we need to accumulate some number of objects like that. Otherwise, from a single object, it's very hard to really uh, draw conclusions. If we only have the crab nebula, the crab uh, pulsar, all the uh, light curves are in, in, in phase. So, but that's clear and express an exception. So we have to accumulate some more data uh, and see what this data lead us to from more uh, millisecond pulsars. So that's sort of the comments I uh, I wanted to make. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank uh, Yanis. Finally, I see again uh, your hand. Is something you want to add? No, no, it's left there. Sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Then, uh, Costa, thank you again. It was very thank interesting you. all that uh, you told us and uh, nice discussion. Uh, for the audience uh, for our seminars, uh, the next one will be again on Tuesday, two hours earlier, the usual time, and will be about uh, quantum chaos. Uh, will be uh, Paolo, if I make if I may make a yes, final please. comment yeah, yeah, here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems that the the uh, injection of particles still evades us. They. The models uh, that Costa says, they're absolutely, uh, well, what can I say, top of the line, that's, uh, <laughs> that's not the expression here. They're extremely detailed, except for the fact that we don't know exactly how to inject the particles. So my feeling is that we have to move in the forward direction. We have to assume that the particles are injected there and see if that has a, uh, what are the repercussions of that? And uh, in searching like that, maybe we'll find a, uh, some kind of consistent solution that'll give us, uh, that'll be consistent with all the information that we see. What's if, kind of interesting here is how sharp these gamma ray lines are. Uh, in some cases, in some other cases, they're not as sharp. So that has to do with uh, how close you, how thin the uh, current sheet is and how close the line of sight really goes through the current sheet. And uh, my feeling is that uh, the same thing will hold also for the, uh, holds also for the black hole cases. And uh, Yanis with uh, Andonis, they have the, uh, uh, the MHD structure of uh, black holes. And we have to somehow focus on that now for, uh, since now we do have images of black holes and uh, we can see in the images the uh, the double cone structure that the uh, radio emission at least has. So uh, that is sort of the general comment I would like to conclude with. Yeah, thank you. Very nice, very nice. So uh, then we're at the end. Uh, uh, thank you again. And uh, let's meet in the next seminar. Bye-bye.